Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Moment of Truth podcast with the one and only me, the incomparable Junior Mint. I am so excited for this episode. I think it is going to be one of the best because this episode I get to sit down and have an amazing conversation with the amazing, amazing Max Pleasure. He is someone who I've known for basically most of my drag career, honestly, because it still is hitting me that I will have only been doing drag for three years this summer. And so I've known Max from, I think, about six months into doing drag. And we have a beautiful discussion in this podcast about community, identity, being yourself, trying to be yourself to the fullest, trying to also build your career and yourself off of the amazing building blocks that black trans people and other queer and trans leaders in our community have laid for us. So... I really hope that you stick around for that conversation. But first, of course, we need to start with our affirmations because we need to be reminding ourselves of why we are amazing, why we shine, why we are fantastic, and why we deserve to take on this day and why this day is built for us. And this day is going to only add more positivity to our life, okay? And so let's start off with this affirmation. And remember, say it with me. Say it out loud. I'm going to be giving you moments in order to repeat it. So make sure you're saying it out loud. Say it like you mean it, and on top of it, feel free to replay this if you need to repeat it again, because there's no such thing as too many positive affirmations. There's no such thing as reminding yourself that you are beautiful and amazing too many times. There is no such thing. So please, if you need to repeat it, go for it. But let's take this in, okay? Here we go. I believe in myself and my capabilities. Every day I am becoming a better version of myself. I radiate with self-confidence and self-esteem. I will be a better version of myself today and I will make the most of this day. I am aligned with my higher self. I manifest abundance easily. I am surrounded by beautiful things and abundance of wealth comes naturally to me. And that wealth is both physical, emotional, mental, And all around you. All of my relationships are healthy and loving. But most importantly, my relationship to myself is healthy and loving. And that is our affirmation for today. (laughs) It is so nice to be able to get it out. And literally as soon as it's over, I immediately feel an uptick in my energy and my positive thinking. And it just, it feels really good to do it. And then it as well feels good to know that people are doing it with you. Because then you know that on top of it, not only you're working on yourself, but as well your community and people around this world are as well working on themselves to be the better versions of themselves. And that is something that always makes me so happy about getting to sit down and record these podcast episodes is because every time when I see that you all are downloading them and you're sharing them and you're listening to them, every single time it always reminds me that all of the internal work that I'm doing, other people are doing as well. And it's so amazing to be able to have a community that is being built around being a better version of yourself and loving yourself more fiercely and loving your community more fiercely, which funnily enough, loving yourself and your community fiercely takes us perfectly to my rose and my thorn of this week. My rose being that this week has been a monumental positive week for my mental health because for the first time in months since the beginning of this pandemic, I can truly say that I actually feel like myself and I would say around like November when I was really beginning to really heal some old trauma that I really was beginning to begin to feel like myself and I could feel like I was coming out of the depression tunnel I like to call it and I'm just so thankful that 
I can say now that I actually like, okay, wow, I haven't felt like Junior in a really long time and I can say it and it feels fantastic. And for the first time in a really, really long time, I am actually, I'm being nice to myself again, which feels weird because when I'm in my depressive holes and I'm in my depressive tunnels, it really is like the only person that I am not nice to is myself. And I am so happy that I've gained a lot of new tools to use the next time I find myself in one of those depressive tunnels. I am patting myself on the back for the courage it took to get here. I am just so thankful for every single person who helped in any way, shape, or form, lended an ear, sent me a Vidmo, asked me how I'm doing. Honestly, every single one of those people as well are the reason why I'm able to reflect and as well on top of it take that reflection and turn it into wisdom that I can use moving forward not for not only for myself but also for every single person listening because yeah depression is difficult depression doesn't look the same for every person and overcoming depression is really just all about taking it at whatever pace that you need to take it at because you cannot rush getting better you cannot rush your mental health and so it really does come down to taking it at your own pace and prioritizing your own mental health doing what you need to do to get better because I can guarantee you that no one else will be able to tell you what you need especially when you are in depression all around in life that's true but as well on top of it in a depression you really really need to listen to yourself more than you've ever listened to yourself and truly, truly take in how you feel, what you're thinking and do some deep diving because you have to sit with yourself through it all and you have to be there for yourself. And that was probably one of the hardest things for me was just sitting there and being there for myself when there were so many other things and people vying for my attention, my energy and It truly was every single person who took the time out to try to refill my energy bucket or to just meet me where I'm at and help to take care of me and help to raise my energy and just take care of me. It was just a real moment of like being seen by your community at a time where you really, really, really needed to be seen, which is throughout this whole time of this pandemic and this quarantine and going through depression, it was all of my friends who tried to raise me up and lift me up and make me see how beautiful and amazing I was that really got me through it. And I'm just so thankful. Yeah, I'm so thankful because, yeah, I wouldn't be here without you. Depression is difficult. Depression is hard as hell. And the love that everyone showed me in my community and my friends and in my loved ones is the exact same reason why I fight so hard for my community every single chance that I get. The fire of my activism and my love for community enrichment, it all stems from the fact that without my community, I would not even be junior mint because my community are the people that really, really made me hone in my voice and understand who I was and the impact that I had on my community on a daily basis. It was when I finally got the opportunity to be surrounded by black trans people, black queer people, and truly got an opportunity to see what my community could be like when it reflected what I looked like and the way that I thought and the love and care that I thought my community deserved. And for the roles to then be reversed on me and to get to see people fighting for me and my family's well-being firsthand, And for me to see the love firsthand when I most need it was more love, more powerful and more impactful than I've ever experienced in my life. And I just want to say thank you to my community. This depressive few months has really, I can say, gave me the tools to really stand up and define and declare what I need for me without shame or guilt because yeah I've I I think that this time has really taught me as well how to put up a lot of amazing boundaries that I needed and it has helped to reinforce something that I've told a lot of other people to do which is to care enough about yourself to let other people know how you will and will not be treated 
Because every single second you spend appeasing somebody else's opinion or trying to make someone else happy is another second that you're not listening to your own self and what you want. It's another second of you not listening to your own advice. And that's exactly what was happening to me. And so I would definitely say, yeah, that is for sure my rose this week. I have come through the tunnel of depression. I will probably at some point again in my life be going back in the tunnel, but I definitely got the tools this time around to help battle it even stronger next time. And so, yes, that is my rose. And to anyone out there with depression, just know you are seen, you are heard, and you are not alone in this because depression is a bitch. But when it comes to my thorn now, I don't have one this week. I am thankful as hell to say that I don't have something that stuck out so much that I had to really think about it and ponder how horrible it was. So I thought that this week for my thorn, what I can do is tackle my Minty Monday topic, which is fulfillment. If you're listening to this and you don't know what my Minty Mondays are, every Monday on my Instagram and on my Patreon, I go in depth into a topic and each topic I like to consider a family member to me. So I'm junior mint. There's abandonment, embarrassment, all of the different words that end in mint. And so I go in depth into each of the topics. It gets a little bit social commentary, a little bit political commentary, but all around again, me commentary. And so This week, I dived into the topic of fulfillment, and I often find that for me, I'm fighting to make sure that fulfillment for me is defined by my connections to people, because I find that when we find fulfillment in physical objects, money, wealth, things like that, I often find that we end up empty at the end in our souls, because mentally for me, I like to think that We are filling our souls up with whatever we find fulfillment in. Because at the end of the day, if your only goal in life is to turn a profit, that's not really what human beings are set out to do. I think that when we truly look at nature, we can see that every living thing thrives off of community in some capacity. Even when we look at nature, every single living thing needs some form of connection to another living thing to survive. And in my opinion, what makes human beings feel good at the end of the day is building upon that connection. And to even root it back to my depression, I just think about how much I want to be alone in my depression. The moment every single time I'm about to go into that depression tunnel, the moment I know that I turned off the highway and it's about to hit the tunnel is the exact moment that I begin to thrive off of not being around people. Because for me, my first symptom of my depression is me becoming a recluse and me needing more me time. When in reality, it's just simply my anxiety making me think that I am horrible to other people, that I'm not even fun to be around, that I'm annoying, all of these different things that I would say to myself as a child. And I would always hold so close to my heart because I thought I was such an annoyance as a child. I thought that I was getting on people's nerves. My brothers would like very much bully me. And that's really the root cause of it all. But at the end of the day, it's the same thing that I do to myself now as an adult when I go into depression. And so for me, it's really opening up. I've been really just sitting and thinking about my connection to myself, my connection to my community and the connection to my loved ones, because the smile that my family gets from a gift that I give to them is worth more than any paycheck I could get from a company. The same way that me taking a self-care day to go get my nails done and get a massage, that is worth more than anything I could get from a job. And of course, I'm not doing that in this pandemic. That was before and as well will be after. But That self-care time is something that I treasure. The connection to myself and to my community and my loved ones are something that I would not give up for the world. And I find that oftentimes people talk about how you get higher up in white collar offices and in white collar spaces and you lose more and more of your humanity. And it only makes so much sense to me, mainly because the higher up you go in an organization based around something that is man-made like money is never going to give you something that is going to make your soul feel fulfilled. Our souls are fulfilled by the simplest of things in life. At the end of the day, human beings are just another animal on this planet. And we must understand that 
the same way that birds get joy from just being a freaking bird. They don't need to make profit or or clock into work. They just are birds the same way that we are just human beings. I'm going to leave you with one piece of advice before we get to sit down with the one and only Max Pleasure. And that is relationships are in fact living things. They must be nurtured and taken care of in order to continue to grow. They are not stationary, stagnant things that you can just claim without putting any energy into taking care of. And so make sure that you are nurturing the relationship between you and yourself, you and your community, and you and your loved ones, okay? Because those relationships need to be nurtured. They need to be pruned. They need love and attention, okay? Now let's get into introducing a -a one-of-a-kind performer. An amazing person, an amazing community member, and an amazing friend. I am so excited to get to introduce 2018's Brooklyn Drag King of the Year, the one and only Max Pleasure, and that is Max with three X's, okay? Max Pleasure, I am just beyond happy to get to sit down and have this conversation with you for this podcast because for me, the true concept and the true thesis statement behind what the podcast is is that the bravest and the strongest thing that anyone can do is stand in the truth of who they are in front of everyone and so yeah I'm so excited for people to get to know the truth of Max Pleasure so how are you doing? I'm doing well thank you for having me on this podcast I'm very excited. (laughs) I couldn't have imagined doing this without you because you're one of those people who I have seen beautifully and fiercely be themselves and fight for themselves and on top of it leave my jaw on the ground when you perform too so it's like one of those things where you're just I'm just so thankful that you're in not only the drag community but also my Brooklyn community because you're a necessary and integral piece of what our community is and so I guess the first question I could even possibly ask you is who is Max Pleasure who is Max Pleasure (laughs) um um my cheeks hurt from smiling from that intro that you just gave me um um max pleasure um is my drag persona but has become so much more than that more than i could have ever expected i mean my first time in drag was in 2014 i've been doing it consistently like in brooklyn since late 2016 early 2017. And yeah, and it's become so much more of a my drag persona and my drag experience has become such an important part of my life. I mean, it was always important, Mm -hmm. but I never knew that most of my friends would call me Max. Most people would refer to me with he, him pronouns like Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the selfies in my phone. I have a mustache. Like I never yes. thought it would be like that. <laughs> when every single photo, like if I scroll through my phone, I can't find photos of me out of drag at all. <laughs> like it's fully just me when I'm feeling the most myself, which is when I've put on the full regalia of drag. We- Agree. And Agree. That's one of the things that I truly love the most about drag is that there is zero like limitations or boundaries to it and it really is like even when you can only go to rainbow and the only shoes you have are the ones your friends gave you and the only makeup skills you have is what you saw on a 30 second tutorial it's like that is still such high drag to me and for me i treasured the beginning years so much of my drag career because i've been I've truly been blessed to have only been doing this for two years now. And it has been a whirlwind. And just like you, like it's become such an integral piece of me, even though I never could have expected it. And so with you having honestly, like you have a bit of a history in drag and that's what I love the most. So where did you start? Did you, did you like start in Brooklyn? No, I didn't. I, um, I went to SUNY Purchase (gasps) And yeah, SUNY Purchase has a very big drag scene for a very small school. So um, that's where I started with Christ with a Q, with Sherry Poppins, with Gender Roll. Um, oh. Ms. Jade also went to Purchase. Are you see- yeah. I am like this, as, like this is just one of those like moments where I'm like, this is 
a thing that I feel like no one in drag knows, but like you, you all came from like the same garden. You came from the same garden of queer people. Yep, we did. Wow. And so SUNY Purchase is in upstate New York, right? Um, yeah, it's, well, it's not really upstate. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it's right near White Plains. Okay. That gives me some good direction. Okay. Okay. (laughs) I have zero idea of anything outside of where like New York is. I'm like, I know where Westchester is and I know where Long Island is and everything that's just like the first few stops on the path. I'm like, okay, okay. I kind of know where that is. So when you were at SUNY Purchase, did did you know any of them? Like, th- were you in like the same year? Oh, so here we go. Sherry was in my t- orientation group, <gasps> which was led by Ms. Jade. Isn't that crazy? You need to recreate that. That needs to be a photo shoot. <gasps> that actually would be really cute. Oh my God. The universe knew what it was doing. Yeah. And that's what's so, it's interesting looking back on and how you just said you really cherish the beginning years. Mm-hmm. I've been thinking a lot about that as well. Um, and it's it's interesting to go all the way back and think <laughs> about, I mean, we were all doing drag. There was a, um, there's an annual drag competition that the school does every year. That was like the big thing. But then Sherry really took the reins mm. and made like events throughout the year. Like there started being parties on um, at the campus housing, the campus apartments, um, which were not allowed. Um, <laughs> of course. But um, it's so interesting looking back because I was one of two kings. Um, Ryder, do you know Ryder Lacour? I've heard of them. Yeah, also went to purchase. <gasps> yeah, actually, wow. Ryder, I owe Ryder the beginning of my drag journey, technically, because I was one of his sexy femme backup dancers oh. for the drag competition. The history. What? I, yeah. It, it's so, it, like, when you said that, like, Sherry began to organize things, it really is, like, it shakes me so much because one of the first, like, actual shows that I heard about where they were talking about, like, young performers getting an opportunity on the stage was straight to DVD. And mm-hmm. now knowing that Christ and Sherry went to the same school, I'm like, oh, this just adds so many layers to every joke I've heard them say together on stage. Yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> We've seen each other at quite interesting times in our lives. Um, I saw Sherry one time in a poncho. She drank a whole bottle of wine and then everyone showed up to her apartment for the after party, which was immediately canceled because she was vomiting everywhere. <laughs> that was after Christ's senior project. They did um, a drag show for their senior project. And that's where I first did my Rock Lobster number, if you've <gasps> ever seen it. I love love that rock lobster number thank you it's it's one of my favorites the, the, the like the two numbers that i remember the most from you is the rock lobster number and okay i can i want i don't want to mess up the song is it um hey there sunshine or okay because i don't want to give it away so i can describe it because no one's watching the video it's the one where like you're like this the whole time and then at the end you're like Ooh. oh with the flowers on the back yes Oh, that's, um, um, oh my God. It's the Beatles. I've only ever done that number once. Um, Oh, Switch and Play. It was that Switch and Play too. Yeah. I I was the first show I saw there and I was first row. I was like front row to it. (laughs) I was like, I think that may have been the first time I saw you perform too, actually. Really? And I remember that number made me cry. That number made me cry. It was just one of those numbers that, your presence on the stage carried such an energy with it and then the number just followed through with that comforting energy it was a comforting loving kind beautiful energy that you brought into the space and I remember it was one of those moments where like I just for the first time like actually had like a very difficult conversation with my mom on the phone about like a boundary I needed and it was like I did I just needed a moment of like oh my god I need someone to just like fill me up with some love and you did it that night you did it. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that because there's like I there are some numbers I do them once I do them forever. That number I only did that one time because something about it like I felt like it didn't click. But I'm happy that it 
clicked for you. <laughs> it cl- it cl- ding dong, ding dong. <laughs> I I'm always so amazed by your energy on stage because. Honestly, when it com- when I think about drag kings, I always think of such a hyper masculine energy. And mm-hmm. you do such a beautiful job of bringing every energy imaginable to the drag king arena. And every single fucking time, the thing that makes me love it so much is it feels like I'm looking at Max. Like you know what I mean? Yeah. Wow. You're like you're making me smile. You're making me sweat. <laughs> you're making me blush. <laughs> All of this is the reasons why I had to have you here because. For me, the things that like always impress me are people being themselves and people d- refusing to box themselves in or limit themselves because of what a societal expectation is, what a club wants of you, what an audience wants of you, like bringing your true, beautiful, natural self to the stage. And I guess my next question for you is, do you have any clue of where that comes from? Like, is it something that you always had or is that something you really had to like grow yourself? Well, so that's... In the beginning days, in the early days, I like, well, I didn't have a handle on like a firm understanding of masculinity and what that meant and what I wanted to portray. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a handle on that. And when I first started performing, I like really went in for the spoofs first. (laughs) Which is crazy because I don't do that anymore, you know? And I kind of think I want to give it a shot again. But Mm. when I first started, I had a Toy Story Woody act. I, like, did Kylo Ren from Star Wars. Good I also had a very good Beetlejuice number. Like, fantastic. Like, oh. But so I, like, because I didn't have my own masculinity figured out, Mm -hmm. I really kind of leaned into these characters that were already created. And now actually I feel kind of a little, I mean, of course I feel stuck right now because uh, you know, everything (laughs) that's going on, but I almost feel that I'm kind of stuck. I'm too stuck in myself now. Oh, let me answer Mm. your question. Um, I would also just like to say what you just said, I really connect with it. Just so you know, I really connect with it. Yeah, and it's so, Well, so I started, I found my own, I fleshed out the character of Max Pleasure. I found masculinity or femininity or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. Like, I really found that through performing in Brooklyn because Mm -hmm. there are so many other kinds of performers who don't box themselves into misogynistic hyper-masculinity, who... Like, Vady was so special Mm -hmm. for me to... I actually, I met them at Straight to DVD. (gasps) Um, Yeah, before they had renamed themselves Vady Bedbug. It's really... Yeah. And I remember they were like, hey, like, introduce themselves. And I was like, wow, this cool person from Brooklyn, like, is being so nice. I had the same exact experience with Thady when I first met them at Primal Scream. It's just like one of those moments where you're like, I was used to walking into a space and like, as a black drag queen, as a trans drag queen, there's a lot of different hoops I feel like I had to jump through at the very early parts of my career. And I could only imagine, I could only imagine the hoops you had to jump through from like 2014. Like, please tell me what it was like to be a drag performer in that time as a young drag king. When I was in school and first starting, I definitely felt that I had to constantly prove myself. Um, Because Sherry and Christ and I, we don't have, we didn't have the relationship that we do Mm -hmm. now. And, um... I wanted to make sure that I got booked in Sherry's shows. I couldn't just ask to be in it like I do now. <laughs> um, actually, no, but there were a few shows of Sherry's when I did ask to be a part of it. And when she said, yeah, sure, you can be in the show, I was like, oh, my God, okay. I have to hit it out of the park because I feel that if I am not fantastic, mm-hmm. I won't be asked again. And that – um in my first few gigs, when I first started performing in other spaces, Mm -hmm. that's like the energy that I had. I was like, I got to fucking murder it because if I don't, it's done. Mm -hmm. Um, And that lit a fire under my ass. Um, Yeah, but I'm really lucky that there was already kings that were active. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't have to explain what I was doing. I didn't have to define drag king for people, luckily, <laughs> because they already knew. Mm -hmm. So I'm really fortunate with that. Mm -hmm. um, but there are still, you know, you'll run into, mm -hmm. I'll run into spaces where where people assume like <laughs> I like this is my first gig <laughs> or something. That happened once. Oh, that's and awkward. I I performed at straight acting. <laughs> which doesn't book just anyone. <laughs> and um, it was the same night as Aquaria. So the place was packed, packed. Lots of Drag Race fans wow. there. And I did a really great number, mm -hmm. I think. There's a video of it. Cameron Cole recorded it. Ooh, and What's the song? I'm, I'm going to look it up after um, this. Trust. The song is called My Dreams Are Televisions by Kissed Her Little Sister, Ooh. which I might have performed at, at In Living Color. It has like kind of a creepy vibe to it, but it works with like my weird facial expressions that I have. Come on, acting. Um, yeah, but so I performed that night and it was a pretty good performance. Mm -hmm. I didn't look that bad. <laughs> Um, I also didn't look that great. I wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't a good time for me. I actually almost fainted at, what's it called? All right. So maybe, maybe I didn't perform my best, <laughs> but somebody, somebody came up to me and was like, you're so great. You have the foundation, just keep going. And I was like, <gasps> ah. foundation. I said, I said, I was like, thank you. Thank you so much. And then I think this happened while I was crouched on the ground next to Shiny Penny, who had just given me a glass of water because I had almost fainted. So, okay. Now that I've reviewed the story, it wasn't my best moment, but it also wasn't my worst. <laughs> um, That's yeah. like one of those stories. <laughs> I'm just so happy we're recording. <laughs> that was like the most beautiful journey. I'm upset and oh, trust God. me, I'm Googling it as soon as we're done here. As yeah, let me know what you think. <laughs> I, I, honestly, I imagine tens across the board because my I truly, like, I tell every single person this. If you went out there and you were yourself and you were true to yourself on that stage, you slayed it. <laughs> yeah, that same night, actually, um, before the show started, someone was like, oh, are you performing tonight? And I was like, yeah, like <laughs> I just came for fun in this whole thing. Yeah. I just thought I would, you know, put on the makeup, do the whole thing and just show up just to show my support to Aquaria. She needs it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've had like some weird comments that was at Metro and Metro people at Metro always have something weird to say to me. You're not wrong. Yeah. Yes. yes. Metro is the place where literally Somebody came up to me and told me they saw oh. one of my numbers that was like Taylor Swift should be in this. What? <laughs> but, but, and then they were like, no, no, you need to collaborate with it in the music. And I was like, so me dragging white people in this number would be perfect for what? Our song is the slam and screen door. <laughs> Like I'm like people at Metro every single time. There was never a single time where I didn't leave without a story. And yes. that was part of the fun of it. <laughs> that is so I like I'm a huge Taylor Swift fan, actually. Like I I'm not gonna lie, the first two albums, Taylor Swift Trust, they played on repeat on my iPod. That's what our song is still my favorite, like uh Taylor it's Swift so song. Good. Our song it's is so the slam and screen door, sneak it out late, tap it on your window. Like, mm, mm. who would not want that? Hey, hey, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I'm honestly like racking my brain like through Taylor Swift's discography, and the Calm Down was a very polarizing. Which experience. which album was that? That was Lover. That was last um, August. This was um, actually, I think it because they said it to be that summer, so like it easily could have been. Okay. Okay. And that like, kind of makes sense. There's a little bit of a. <laughs> I could see the train of thought that went off the rails somewhere. We <laughs> X filed it because at when when there are those mysterious cases, you gotta get to the bottom of them. You gotta get to the bottom of it. And okay, this is a very weird crossroads, but this does bring me to another topic because. I always like the X file things, and I love the X files. Like Scolder and Mully are like, if I could have been Jillian Anderson in that series, give me a boxy pantsuit and a gun. Like, 
let me go find these aliens. <laughs> Let's go get these aliens, okay? And so, it's like, all of those science fiction shows play such a deep role in who Junior Mint is. And I wonder, are there any, like, fictional characters or real-life characters who you drew inspiration or love or anything from to build, Max? The look was informed by Johnny Depp, RIP. Um, this was back in the day. Mm-hmm. Um, but so my mom loved Johnny Depp. Okay. Um, so he was at the time a positive representation of masculinity. Mm-hmm. I also was really drawn to the fact that he was a character actor. Mm-hmm. Cause I was like, that's kind of like what I'm trying to do. Also, I like, I, I've had such an aversion to wearing wigs in my drag career. Yeah. I don't, For me, I've always thought that I take myself too seriously, but plenty of other drag performers also don't wear wigs. So maybe I have to be nicer to myself. Um, I think you should be because this hair is drag. My hair is drag. Thank you. I really was drawn to Johnny Depp's look and like his persona. Um, I kind of navigated from there. Like I definitely wanted to go with the rocker type. Mm Except as I've gotten to work with really intelligent people and people who have not only really great ideas about navigating masculinity, but also navigate it in a way that's admirable, I've kind of been like, all right, is the rock star pers- there are some elements of the rock star persona that I definitely don't want to mm-hmm. embody. <laughs> embody and encourage and put on the stage like the misogyny aspects and stuff. Mm -hmm. Harry Styles, this is why I love Harry Styles, because he is the modern rock star. He plays with femininity, he's a sex symbol, he's talented, but he leaves behind being feminine um, or wearing dresses for shock factor. He doesn't partake in misogyny. Like, he's actually very, like, Watermelon Sugar, for example, like, that song is about going down on his girlfriend, like, in the most respectable, fun yep. way. It was all about going down on me. Yep. <laughs> me, Harry Styles' girlfriend. That's me. That's that's literally, I don't know who out there Harriet told was their girlfriend, but it's me. <laughs> like, that's the kind of, that's why I'm so drawn to Harry Styles, because that's the kind of, that's exactly the mark that I want to hit. I want to have that rock star persona, that sexy, messy type of thing, Mm -hmm. but I don't want to like be misogynistic or gross. (laughs) Literally, I, that's part of one why I love Harry Styles so much is because, yeah, it feels so not shock value, which is what I so appreciate because Mm -hmm. it's just like I was saying before, it feels like he brings his fully authentic self to the table and it doesn't feel like, did you just do this because the stylist handed it to you or are you actually understanding the gravity of depicting Mm -hmm. yourself in this dress on this magazine and what it's representing for people and what you could be misrepresenting with your words. And Mm -hmm. so when I heard Harry Styles actually go in depth and just kind of talk about like what his gender meant to him, what wearing the dress has meant to him, it was so vulnerable. It was so honest and it was just so... I don't feel like this is an act. Wow. I actually did not get around to reading the article yet. Mm -hmm. But I'm so glad to hear that. Because sometimes, like, queer celebrities, like Kristen Stewart, for example, I love Kristen. I love her ever since Twilight. But sometimes, like, she says shit, and I'm like, oh, Mm. like, I wish you had. But then again, like... (sighs) I still, I will always love her. Mm -hmm. And I, like, and it's so interesting thinking about queer celebrities. Mm -hmm. Like, they're also still celebrities. Like, Kristen Stewart didn't go to high school. She, like, has, she has been an actor traveling the globe, doing Chanel and shit. Like, she hasn't, like, (laughs) gotten to meet all these queer people. (laughs) And hang out at the bar yep. and do a drag performance. You know, like her experience is very different. So I'm really happy to hear that Harry Styles like mm-hmm. talked in a way that felt it- good to you. And he also like 
he leads by example and embeds these messages i think like in his music like how his whole there's a song on fine line called to treat people with kindness mm. and all his merch says that mm -hmm. all he always signs off things with tpwk like and i think that's the kind of I, like i'm happy he can talk the talk when he needs to talk the talk mm -hmm. but i think there's so much more influence that can happen when it's just woven in there mm -hmm. and just lived, mm -hmm. you know? Oh, that, and that's, that honestly is like the, the summation of how I feel. For me, when someone is truly genuinely being who they are and truly representing exactly who they are, honestly, it's naturally going to be woven in. That's why I fell in love with Gaga. You can see how she truly meant every single thing she said in 2008 from now and how it's like she talked about kindness in 2008 and treating people correctly and kind and everyone is equal and all of these things. And to the same day, she is still standing up on the stage saying the same thing. She has bo born this way foundation, um, all of these different books, everything. It it makes me so happy to see people walk the walk because it means that that's truly who they are. Yes, mm -hmm. there's some business and everything. We all got to brand ourselves if you're in entertainment, all of that. But the fact that you chose to make your brand kindness is like... Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. You made your brand kindness. And while if you're going to make any money off of a brand, please make it kindness because then at least there's some more kind people walking around these streets for me. And mm -hmm. to bring it back to you, I feel like you do that for this community. I feel like you truly do it for this community. Well, if you had one piece of advice, if you had one thing that you could say to your community, whether it be advice, whether it just be a message, what would you say to your community? I That's a really big question. Because I feel like I've learned so much from the community. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to also be like, no, wait, but also... I also have a presence and an effect in the community. And that's been shown, you know? Mm -hmm. um, crap, what would you say? I always, whenever anybody asks me to say anything to, like, anything, any someone, I always just immediately think, what has my community said to me? And what I always reiterate back to my community is, you are valued, you are important, even when you don't think you have value, you still have value. And on top of it, you hold importance not only to your own life, but to your neighbor's life, to the homeless person on the street's life, to your cousin's life, to the, the mayor's life. We are all interconnected in this. And every single day that we recognize that and we choose to act in a better sense, whether that be better for ourselves or our community, it's inevitably doing universal good. And so what I would say is, as you navigate every space that you're in, as you navigate every single situation you find yourself in, move with kindness, move with empathy, and move with Black trans power. Because at the end of the day, no matter what we want to believe, your actions do affect people. Choosing to sit in your house all day in a depressive hole does affect people. There are people who care about seeing you. There are all of these different things. And those are things I had to remind myself in the depressive hole was like, mm -hmm. wait, Junior, you have to remember that you mean things to other people. You mean things to other people. And you may at this moment not care that much about yourself, but you have to care about yourself right now because other people care about you. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I would say to my community. So like, keep that in mind whenever you're in your deepest moments, you're in your saddest moments, and when you're in your happiest moments. Because so oftentimes we just revel in the happiness and don't actually think about what it took to get that happiness and who, yeah. who sa whose happiness was sacrificed for me to get this happiness. Who's, whose sadness was sacrificed that like got some joy out of this. Like it's just remembering that every single thing you're experiencing has been affected and will affect someone else. And so keep in mind that when positive things happen to you, try to pass out some more positive things. When something negative happens to you, try to turn it into a positive. You can't always, but trying mm -hmm. is still a thing. Okay, I know what I would say. Mm -hmm. I would say thank you. <laughs> that would be, I mean, I like, cause I often like for my YouTube channel and stuff, I'm like, all right, what, what advice do I have? And like, I have plenty of like pieces of advice, mm -hmm. but like, the way you and I are talking now and you say, what would you say to your community? I'm thinking of Switch and Play. I'm thinking of Untitled. <laughs> I'm thinking of like all these people who have made spaces for me 
on their stage or next to them at the bar, you know, and like, yeah, just thank you. (laughs) And honestly, that's perfect. That's perfect. Because do you know why I love your answer so much? Because it's you. That's the thing. It, it, that's you. And whatever came out of your mouth right there naturally is what the community needed to hear. That is that there is no wrong when you're, when you're truly being yourself, you did everything that you would do. And so you did it right. And I've had to learn that is that like, there is no, there is no me doing me wrong. There's only me lying to myself. And Mm. when I lie to myself, that's when I get depressed. (laughs) It's when I truly can say, oh no, I was myself fully. And if this is what happens because I'm myself fully, that was meant to happen then. Because the one thing I'm not going to change is me. <laughs> That's, and it's it's funny that you say that because that, and what I was thinking through when I was like, what would I say to my community? Mm-hmm. Like the person who started doing drag in 2016, 2017, and, the, and me now, I feel almost are two completely different separate people. And there have definitely been times throughout my drag my drag journey when I wasn't feeling truthful to myself. And I wasn't like Mm. you saying like, you can't do you wrong. Like I think I actually did do myself (laughs) wrong at some times, but that's what's so amazing is that being a part of this community and the connections that I made and the people that I've met All of the steps in the journey have led me to where I am now, which is somebody who has boundaries and somebody who understands the idea of navigating your life with integrity and with principles and being an active member of a community. That's something that I never like understood, you know, and Yeah, I hope that makes sense. No, that made complete sense. That makes complete sense because there was this meme that I saw that was like, when you look back and cringe and you look at things that you did and you cringe, that only means you grew. (laughs) If you look back on something and you're like, no, that was perfect. Okay, so you're the same person and you see the world the same way you did back then because whether you love it more or less is like up to you, but like you should feel differently. And that's Mm -hmm. a whole nother thing that I consistently remind myself is that like no one person should be the same by the end of the day, Mm -hmm. whether it is you've spent time by yourself, you spend time with a roommate, a stranger, whatever it is, whatever you did, you came into contact with something that could inform and educate who you are now, the world you live in. And so if you are not changing every day, you're not intaking any information. You're not taking in the fact that like, Okay, like even with coronavirus, I'm like, okay, I still have to like in some way check in on how this is happening. And it makes me more pissed off at the government. And I'm like, okay, I'm different at the end of this day. I'm more pissed (laughs) at the government. It means I'm living in a community. It means that people's lives are affecting me. And when I don't change, I've realized it's one of those things where I've kind of shelled myself off and I've kind of like made it an island of one. And I'm not actually in a community anymore. I'm just my own isolated thing, not trying to change. And Mm -hmm. yeah, I've learned to really value and appreciate every change that I have, even when it comes down to like a moment where I'm like, I hate this food now. Appreciate it. You don't have to go back to liking it, Junior. You can now hate this food. (laughs) If you want to like it later, okay. But like, you can hate it. Mm -hmm. The growth, the growth. (laughs) We love growth. (laughs) Truly, truly. And I'm going to hit you with your last question, okay? Okay. Are you ready for this? This is a great question. So I, over this past eight or nine months, I have been getting more and more just in tune with who I am and what my purpose is as a person and what I want to move forward with my energy creating in terms of like, I know I want to create more space. I know I want to create more, more platforms for other people to stand on and use their voice. And I've realized more and more that like when it comes down to it, if somebody were to be like, put down your job title into one thing, I would definitely say I'm an activist because even my drag comes down to if it's not uplifting and enriching somebody, I don't really want to be on the stage. Like I only want to be there if somebody can look out and be like, that bitch just says something that I've never heard articulated in a queer space before. And I need to hear it again. And so, yeah, that's kind of what I've been realizing. And so I guess with the rest of this year winding down and next year being whatever it will be, 
what energy are you taking into the future? Not necessarily what you're going to do. If you have plans, you can share them. But like, just what energy are you planning on moving forward with? Wow. (laughs) You really saved the hard question for last. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I definitely, I think I want to take on more of a helping kind of role. Mm -hmm. I, because I've been thinking a lot about the way that I interact with spaces and how there's a part of me that, especially as a performer, when you're constantly looking for new opportunities, new shows you could be a part of, all this stuff, like I definitely want to enter spaces and take on projects with other people where what's in it for me, I don't want that to be the driving factor. Mm. I want to take on a helping role, which is like, I'm really happy that I just articulated that the way that I did, but it's definitely something that the way that I've been isolated during this pandemic and the way that I've been, you know, interacting with people on social media, watching digital shows and, and also like learning a lot about myself and like doing a lot of like that self work Mm. quotes. Um, (laughs) It just, I definitely want to let myself take a backseat and participate in things that aren't about me and participate in things where I'm behind the scenes, like not even credited, like, you know? I think a lot of people who listen to this will find themselves really relating to what you just said, because I think that this, this time has done nothing but amplify the power we all carry with us. And I think that a lot of people have been coming to terms with the amount of power that they have, the amount of influence that they have. And Mm -hmm. what you're saying is the type of thing that like, that's how communities continue. Like that's how communities last. That's how communities thrive. And it's, it makes, it just makes me so happy to hear that because in my head, you've already been doing it. That's the thing. In my head, like you being yourself, like I always tell people, if you don't have money, still go to the drag show, stand to the back, but be the loudest cheering. Like, I'm like, Mm -hmm. it's the type of thing where everyone has something to bring to the community in every aspect. When it comes to producers, when it comes to spaces, when it comes to booking, I found that like, I've been able to thrive so much because when other people are like, no, I want to support you. Like, no, I know about, I know the owner of this very weird space that would love to do a drag show. And I think you should be the one to talk to them about it. Like all of these very different, strange avenues where it's just people saying, this is a connection that I have and I want you to use it. And it's without that love, without that attention, without someone wanting to give it, no, nothing will ever be given because at the end of the day, no one can go into your wallet, but you, and that's money resources everything and Mm -hmm. your energy what you have done with your career the doors you have opened the smiles you have brought to people's faces every single thing that you do is something that I can only imagine how many queer kids are sitting out in their rooms right now who have seen you in person or through digital drag who feel comforted who feel seen who feel like they have someone they can look up to and so just know that you have been helping like you're a person who you have been doing good so all i heard was you're trying to do more good in the future so i want you to know how i heard it (laughs) you made me like tear up a little bit not to be like silly but you did i like it's thank you for saying that it's just i feel that i want to make sure i play a part in that community Mm. magic. You're amazing. (laughs) You are absolutely amazing. And I am so thankful to have gotten to sit down and talk to you. I am beyond blessed to have got this opportunity. And so before we say our goodbyes and sign off, tell all of the amazing listeners where they can find you, where they can support you, where they may be able to donate some Venmo, Cash App, PayPal type of action. Um, Okay, so I am on Instagram at Mr. Dot M Pleasure, M-R dot M Pleasure. Um, I'm on YouTube at Max Pleasure with three X's. Um, there's gonna be new videos up eventually. Um, I'm also on Twitter. I'm also on Tumblr. <laughs> You're still on Tumblr? 
Yes. <laughs> You're an icon for that. I that's that's where I participate in the in the Taylor Swift fandom. So <laughs> don't even Reddit is where I'm in the Mariah fandom. So like I can't even talk. I, I actually I was gonna get into Reddit, except I couldn't get the hang of it. Do it, do it. When I tell you, I found my social media platform. Okay, I love you, Max. You're amazing. Thank you. I truly hope that you enjoyed this interview. I know that I got so much wisdom out of it. I am like bursting at the seams. I am like smiling ear to ear because this is exactly why I do this. I know I say it every single episode, but this is exactly why I do this. There are so many beautiful conversations that I get to have with so many fantastic people that I always want so many people to hear the amazing people that are in their community, the people who are literally standing with them at a bus stop, at the train station. These are amazing people within your community who deserve your respect on and off of the stage. Our lives matter not only when we're giving you entertainment, not just when we're performing inside of a bar for you. So that is part of why I'm so excited about this podcast. And when I tell you, I am so excited for some of the editing tips and tricks that I've just picked up that you're going to really see a real like coming of age of this podcast. And I'm so excited because it's only growing and it's only and it's also adding something very amazing to my life personally. I can say that this podcast is also what helped to pull me out of my depression because this has honestly been a project that I've been thinking about for a very long time. And it feels so right to be doing this. It feels so right and natural to be speaking with you all this way. And I only want to keep getting better and better so that way I can keep giving you all more of the wisdom and lessons that I've learned, sharing members of my community with you all. And so thank you. And I can only say thank you. Max Pleasure said it best in the podcast, but thank you. And I hope to continue making you all proud with everything that I create and as well making you all feel like you have someone who's representing you and fighting for you as well. So sending you all of the love. I'm so excited for you to find out who next week's guest is. They are someone who is very close to my heart. They are stunning. They are amazing. They are the phenomenal Mohawk. And if you don't know Mohawk, you're about to. So get ready for another freaking amazing episode next wednesday thank you for listening thank you for tuning in and as per usual keep being bad bitches i love you bye